begin our worship this morning, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us. Welcome, everyone, on this beautiful spring morning. Um, we are hosting our Wednesday Lenten service again this week, and we'll be sending it via email virtually. Uh, for Holy Week, our schedule is as follows. On Palm Sunday, we will be worshiping in person in the sanctuary led by Mark Falaza. The choir quartet will provide a special program of music and readings. Those who do not feel comfortable worshiping in person will be able to enjoy our service virtually. On Monday, Thursday, we will have a 7 p.m. in-person worship in the sanctuary. Reverend Tom Coy will lead us. Communion during this service will take place, take, will be held in place of the normally scheduled first Sunday communion. Easter Sunday, we will have in-person worship here at St. Andrews at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock a.m., led by Mark Favazza. Additional opportunities for outdoor worship will be held at Campbell Presbyterian in Weems at 6.30 a.m., 9 o'clock a.m., and 11 o'clock a.m. Please look at your Friday emails for more details on these services. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of Almighty God.
Good morning. It is good to be with you in this very special way that we have to be together as God's family. We are very much looking forward to joining together in the coming weeks, being together as a church family in not just a virtual way, but in a real way. And we look very forward to that coming time. So uh, God's blessings on you as you prayerfully consider joining us again. Uh, in person as we worship together. This morning, as we continue during this season of Lent, our focus and our thoughts uh, fall upon this sense of joining together as God's people and considering where we are in our relationships with God. That really is what Lent is about. It's that time of self-examination where we Take a moment to see where God is at in our own hearts. And so this morning, our passage of Scripture uh, comes from Psalm 51. This is perhaps a psalm that you may have heard of before. It's Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. And this is the heartfelt prayer of, of David. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin it is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and, and done this evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the inward part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all, all of my iniquities. Create in me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. These are God's words of good news. Let us bow in prayer. And Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity of hearing and seeing and knowing, O oh God, your word. And may it now speak peace to us. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we take a moment or two to look at this story of David that is captured within this heartfelt prayer of his. And we know that this story is one that we can all identify with, one which really speaks to the ways in which we acknowledge in certain ways that, that somehow in some ways we have fallen short of, of all of what God wants us to be in our lives. One of the things that I get to do a great deal of in, as a chaplain over at the hospital, uh, of course one of, the, one of the first things that I get to do is, is, is go visit with people and uh, to kind of hear their stories and and, and to really represent God's presence to them in the midst of what they're doing. And, 
And I love, I love the story of, of the one chaplain who was visiting with patients, and uh, he went into this one uh, uh, gentleman's room, and uh, they got to talking, and uh, the, the chaplain happened to notice a, 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 a thing of, of peanuts on the man's uh, bedside table. And as they were talking, he kind of reached over and grabbed a few and ate a few, and he uh, continued to talk and continued to talk. Well, he grabbed a few more, and before very long, he said, oh my goodness, I have, I need to leave now. I somehow managed to eat all of your peanuts. And the old fellow in the hospital bed, the patient, he just kind of looked up, he said, that's all right, chaplain, I've already sucked all the chocolate off of them anyway. I always have some experiences as a chaplain like that. One of the other things that I get to do as well that, that is very exciting for me is I get to do something called spirituality groups. And uh, we invite uh, the, uh, the patients who are able to do so to come join us in a room and, and we share together and sometimes we'll read a daily devotional or we'll do jokes and uh, stories together and, and things of that nature. And I get to do that in the acute setting, but also in behavioral health as well. And uh, one of the things that I always do in behavioral health, uh, especially, uh, is I'll take a piece of paper, and uh, uh, what I do is I always take that piece of paper, and I fold it, and I begin to tell them a little bit of a story, and then I fold it again, I talk to them a little bit about safe places, and it's important because safe places are very, very important for all of us, and uh, we all need those places where we can feel like uh, we're going to be okay. And uh, sometimes, especially for those who are going through uh, behavioral health, mental health issues, uh, finding and, and having that kind of safe, safe space is very, very important. And I talked to them about uh, growing up. And for me, home was a very safe place. And, and I recognize and I tell them that, you know, not for everybody, uh, you know, growing up in a, in a home or a house was, was not always a safe place. Uh, but for me it was, and I, I'll tell some of those stories to them and, and invite them to share uh, their stories as well. And then uh, I began to say, but you know what? Uh, as we grow up, something happens. And one of the things that happens is this. It's that we, uh, we begin to, to leave that safe space or those places uh, in our lives. And well, uh, sometimes we leave by uh, going away or sometimes we, we leave by running away. Sometimes, well, for whatever the reasons, uh, we, uh, we leave those safe places in our lives. And I even make like a little airplane because I remember that uh, when I was getting ready to go off to college, I flew to a couple of different uh, college places that I thought I wanted to go to. And uh, so I make my little paper airplane like that. And so we all, we all wind up in places. And uh, the thing that, that I try to remind each of them as they are going through what they're going through in this particular space and place, because they're filled with anxiety, it's a new setting for them, and they're very anxious about what will take place uh, during their time there. And, and I began to talk to them a little bit about, you know what, we all had things that happen in our lives, things that rip at us, things that tear on our hearts, Things that, that help us and sometimes make us feel like we are alone and we're alienated from the rest of the world. And, you know, one of the very difficult things that we all face in our lives is this idea that we're going to have to go through the things that are happening in our lives all alone. That there's nobody there for us to help us and to support us. And the thing that I begin to let them know, that we can all know, is this, that we are not alone, that God is with each of us, that, that God is at the center and at the heart of who we are, 
And this morning I want us to share just a little sense of, of what that idea means to us. That we are cross-referenced. That, that no matter what happens in our lives, God's presence is with us. And as He has promised, that He will never leave us or forsake us. He is our Good Shepherd who leads us not only to green pastures and still waters, He is also that God who, when the valleys are dark and the clouds and there doesn't seem to be any light, He is that light. That's His promise. We, as God's people, have been cross-referenced. And we see that being indicated in our story today, even with David. For you see, David has this rich sense of who God is. And he calls upon God for restoration. He calls upon God for renewal. He calls upon God for this new beginning again in his life. And so, this morning, we take the opportunity as we review the story of David to also seek again that sense of beginning with God in our lives. This morning, we know that, that David writes these words, these words that are so powerful and so confessional, these moments when he is literally cut to the quick. We know these words because these are the words of David. Now we find the story that, that takes place here in, in 2 Samuel in, in chapters 11 and 12. And it is this story of, of, of David who one day while king happens to, uh, instead of focusing on fighting the battles and doing the things that a king should do, he focuses in on uh, this beautiful woman, Bathsheba, and he is drawn to her. And before very long, he ha has a relationship with her. And what happens is, then he has her husband, because she's already married, she ha he has her him killed. All deceitful, all of those things that have broken the heart of God, David has done. He's lied. He's lied to Nathan, who comes to him and, and talks to him and, and tells him exactly what he's done, and, and David denies it until Nathan calls him on it. And then we have this prayer, this sense of, of David coming face to face with his own sinfulness. And instead of continuing to deny it, seeks instead to ask God's forgiveness. And this morning, that is a message for us as the people of God. We know this. We know that the Bible tells us very clearly that, uh, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know this, that the wages of sin is death, as Paul would write later in, in Romans. We know that sin is that thing that separates us from our relationship with God, that thing that takes that cross-reference out of our life, but God is intent on this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That Christ took upon your sins and my sins. He took upon those sins and placed them on himself. That we might have that oneness in relationship with God. That's the work of redemption. And Paul says this, that there is nothing, there is nothing that is able to separate us 
from the wonderful love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what we celebrate as we think of this particular story. Because here's what we know transpires. Even when David has done all of these things, has broken all of these commandments that, that God has said are the test of purity for a person who wants to be God's own. Even though David has broken them, here's what the scriptures tell us about David. That he is a man after God's own heart. He is a man after God's own heart. But how can that be? How can it be? It is because of what we celebrate. The story of redemption. Of how God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him could not perish and have everlasting life. That's the story of redemption. My daughter this week was uh, doing, uh, she serves uh, with not only with all the other jobs that she has going on, she is also the drama and theater director at the high school uh, where she lived, nearby where she lives. And uh, this past week they were doing their virtual performances online uh, for this uh, high school. And uh, it reminded me of, uh, of a different play. Uh, she was doing Beauty and the Beast, uh, and certainly there are some great stories within that story. But it reminded me of another Broadway show that, that we saw once, and it was The Man of La Mata. And it's based upon a book by Cervantes, uh, Don Quixote. And in that wonderful story, uh, as the part of the story kind of transpires, we see a, kind of a really wonderful story of redemption. It starts off with this man of La Mancha. And of course, in this, in this uh, beautiful uh, musical, there's some wonderful songs, one that you probably remember called uh, To Dream the Impossible Dream. There, there are others as well. But in this story, uh, there is the man of La Mancha. And he has a unique way of seeing things in a totally different way than other people see them. Uh, sometimes it's kind of baffling in that he sees, for example, uh, uh, windmills and thinks that perhaps they are giants. But he has another gift too, and that is seeing people in a unique way. And one of those unique people is is a prostitute woman by the name of Aldanza. Now the first time that he sees her, he sees who she is and uh, he sees how she's dressed and he looks at her and he calls her my lady. He fashions himself as a king and he sees her as his queen. My lady, he says, and he calls out to her. And she says, do you not know who I am? I was born by a mother who had me in the middle of a ditch somewhere and left me there to die. I am not any lady. The story goes on. And in fact, he, he sees her a number of times. And he says, you know what? I, I see you totally differently. I have a name for you, my lady. It's not Aldonza. It's, it's Dulcinea. Dulcinea. Well, later on, she comes back on stage, and, and the man from La Mancha sees her and looks at her, and she has just been ravished by a group of rough travelers who have seen her and dealt with her in the barn. And she is in hysterics and he, he again addresses her, my lady, Dulcinea, 
And she screams out at him and says, I am not Dulcinea. I am Aldonza. Don't you see? Nothing but a toy to their passions. I'm not anything. And she cries and runs off stage. The story continues on as we go through the story of the man of La Mancha, it comes to the final closing portions. And as he is there lying upon his deathbed, this beautiful, queenly Spanish woman comes, and he says, who, who are you? And she rises up, all of her queenly beauty, and, and she says, I, I am all, I am, I am Dulcinea. Dulcinea. And there, the work of redemption is taking place. Someone who viewed themselves as flawed and dirty and ugly has now been recreated into this beautiful creation. That is the work of redemption that God does in each one of our hearts and lives. He transforms all of those things about us that we hate about ourselves and makes them whiter than snow. He takes all of those God-given possibilities that we have within us and makes them real. discovered that sense of renewal in his life. Countless others have as well. Peter was sometimes jokingly referred to as Peter, the rock. Most of the time he felt like a pebble because of the ways that he misunderstood Jesus. God saw him. Jesus saw him as a rock and called him that. You see, the work of redemption is still at play in each of us, too. That we, as we seek to be people after God's own heart, he wants to change us, too. Aldonza, Dulcinea, Saul, Paul, Christian, you, me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, It is our holy prayer that during this time of Lent that you will absolutely recreate in us a new heart. 
that we will claim that name of Christian. That we will become what you have destined us to be. Little Christs in the worlds in which we live. For we ask it in your name.
stretching into more than a year, uh, that you recognize and realize that uh, God is still with us. And our trust and our hope as we continue to do, to do uh, these services and as they change back into uh, live services, that both opportunities are available for you uh, as our church family. And uh, we just, you know, our heart's desire is that however you are a part of our ministry here, that, that God will bless you and touch you in very special ways. And so we're very, very thankful for the opportunities to reach out to one another in this particular way and for the coming uh, changes that we have as well. So our, our hope and our thoughts and prayers is that the ministry of our church will continue to reach and to touch you in these various ways. This morning, uh, God is continuing to bless us in so many ways. And uh, we take the time now to join together as God's family as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us not our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are so very blessed, and we ask that uh, as we conclude our service now, that uh, you will continue to experience God's presence during this season of life. Receive now our benediction as God's family. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to look deeper into our own hearts and our souls. We thank you as well, O oh God, for this, for your great love, for the height and the depth, for the length and the width of your love toward us. And we pray, O oh God, that our roots would grow down deep into the soil of your marvelous love. Amen. Thank you.